Good evening. You're watching The Big Story with Haryanto Diman. I'm Olivia Quay. If you're watching us on YouTube, do subscribe to the Straits Times channel if you haven't already done so. We begin with the figures for today. The Health Ministry confirmed 570 new COVID-19 cases today, including two Singaporeans or permanent residents. The total number of cases in Singapore now stands at 29,364 and MOH will release more details later in the evening. Meanwhile, in a Facebook post today, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong said that while the circuit breaker has worked, people had to get used to a new normal and returning to the previous state of affairs is not possible. He added that Singapore cannot stay closed forever, so adjustments to our routines to live and work safely have to be made despite the global pandemic. The multi-ministry task force announced yesterday that the circuit breaker will end on June 1st as planned and Singapore will gradually resume activities in three phases, safe reopening, safe transition and safe nation. Health Minister Gan Kim Yong said that in the first phase, the risk of a resurgence in community transmission is high. Are we risking a second wave of infections as we ease restrictions? Some businesses and workers may also be disappointed that activities can't resume immediately come June the 2nd. So let's pose these concerns to Professor Teo Yik Ying, Dean of the Sorcery Hawk School of Public Health at the National University of Singapore. Prof Teo, what do you make of the government's broad plan, the three phases, to transition Singapore out of the circuit breaker? Does it strike a balance, do you think, between allowing more flexibility of movement and enforcing enough restrictions to contain the community spread? Thank you. I was actually happy to hear about the plan to ease Singapore out of the circuit breaker in three phases. It is not just in what is in each phase, but also the way the plan has been communicated clearly to the public. And compare this with how easing has been executed in some other countries, you will realize that Singapore's approach to communicate this 11, 12 days before the 1st of June actually allows the public, the workplaces and businesses to clarify any confusion, any doubts, and to make plans to prepare accordingly. I'm glad that in the first phase, there is sufficient easing that allows for some family interactions now with parents, with grandparents, this is very important because it maintains the well-being of the elderly and yet minimizes the risk of infection to them. The overarching principles in easing the circuit breaker have been based on what the world currently knows about the way the coronavirus is transmitted. When people interact in close proximity for an extended period, be it in households, at workplaces, at dining facilities or work sport, sports facilities, so maintaining a degree of restrictions on the majority of these activities as we ease towards phase one or in phase one is actually very prudent because worldwide there is still very little signs that transmission is widespread in schools. So to a large extent, school activities can resume, but of course, to be accompanied by strict restrictions such as staggered recess timing, temperature taking, mask wearing, personal hygiene, reducing the flow of students back into the school at any time with this alternate home-based learning and on-site learning approach. So I think it is important to note that every country is trying to figure out what works and what didn't. And if we do see new infections that emerge with the easing, I think the mindset that we should take is that we have to watch some of these sectors very carefully and perhaps to tighten the easing. But we should not have the mindset that with this phased approach, Singapore is all clear from now. And I think it is also very important to note that while there is some degree of easing, it is not just lifting these measures without having accompanying approaches such as aggressive testing of the key frontline workers, safe entry registration to track people movement in specific location, intense disinfection protocols, and some workplaces actually now may require workers to download certain contact tracing applications. Mm. Um, Prof, you briefly mentioned uh, with regard to comparison to other countries. Uh, let's zoom in on a, a bit on that. Uh, how does Singapore's uh, three phases compare to other countries, uh, for instance, China, Hong Kong, and South Korea? How did you know how are we doing? They've eased restrictions, but some are seeing another wave of infections. Well, the, the principles of easing are actually very similar between Singapore and 
some of these East Asian regions that you have talked about. Even though the actual implementations do differ, uh, the principles are the same. And I think this is very important. For example, all the countries that you have talked about have allowed students to return to schools, but very strict measures have been put in place to protect the students to minimize the risk of transmission in the schools. Hong Kong, for example, have also allowed some degree of dining in and movie watching in cinemas to be allowed, but there is a need for safe distancing, strict hygiene and disinfection to happen in these places. And they actually only allow a maximum of 50% of the usual capacity. So what Singapore has decided to do is to take a phased approach and explicitly articulated these different phases, what is allowed in each of the different phases. Some countries may not have specified the different phases so clearly, uh, whereas UK, for example, have laid out their plans and have and communicated this very clearly that they have a free stage plan as well. Earlier on, you mentioned that there are new classes of infection happening in, for example, China, South Korea. And I think for China, this has very much been in the Heilongjiang province, which borders Russia. For South Korea, it was in the Itaewon district with the clubs. But I think we have to bear in mind that these countries are geographically much larger than Singapore with many more people. I mean, Korea, you have 52 million. China, you're talking about 1.3, 1.4 billion people. So I think when we start to see reports that there are new clusters emerging, we have to be uh, somewhat uh, judicious in the, our interpretation because I think the reality is whether it is in Singapore or other countries, there will be new clusters of infections that will be reported. Of course, we would love to say that we will never see any more cases, but I think the real challenge to Singapore and to any country is how to pick up these cases quickly, perform the aggressive contact tracing that is necessary to contain further spread in a community. And I think this is the real challenge for societies as countries emerge from their lockdowns. And to be honest, my, my concern has always been about having a plan that works to handle the occasional flare-ups, to be able to successfully detect and to put out the occasional fires. Because the reality is the coronavirus that we're facing is very infectious. It is going to be very difficult to completely prevent new infections or clusters from emerging, especially when we're looking at a perfect record for a long period for 12, 18, or even 24 months until the vaccine arrives. Mm. Well Professor Chiu, let's uh, delve deeper into what you uh, touched on earlier about mindset. So a small segment of the population may take advantage of the easing of restrictions in the first phase. There have already been breaches of safe distancing throughout the circuit breaker and most recently the gatherings at Robertson Quay. So when it comes to mindset, what, what sort should the public adopt and what should we, what should we be ready for? I think the reality is that in any society, there will be that small group of people in the population that always wants to test and push the boundaries. So people, there will be people who are unhappy that the easing is happening too fast or happening too slowly. And this is why earlier on I talked about the principles behind the considerations that we take, the country is taking to ease the restrictions. Because the principles are very much based on science, evidence, and to some extent, common sense. So this is where I expect the bulk of the population, the bulk of the public will actually understand why the easing has to happen in phases, why there are some rules that still cannot be relaxed at this point. And I think with regards to people who blatantly disobey the rules, this is where enforcement of the regulations comes in and it becomes important because this enforcement has to be consistent, it has to be fair. There will be significant loss of trust if the public perceives there are different set of rules for different people. Mm. Prof, talking about conditions, so phase one is expected to last at least four weeks uh, and then Minister Gunn said phase two could last several months and will only transition to a new normal in phase three when a vaccine is found. We have a rough idea of the timeline now but uh, in terms of, say, conditions or criteria, uh, what other criteria should the government be looking at uh, specifically when deciding to move, say, from phase one to phase two or even eventually to phase three? So I think it is clear the indicators will include whether those sectors that are allowed to resume under phase one, 
have resulted in new infections happening, whether known or unknown. And what I mean by known infection is that there are cases that are specifically linked to these sectors, especially through the registration of safe entry and contact tracing. We know that these are the work sectors that were allowed to be opened to be, uh, for people to return to work, and that it leads to an increase in infection. By unknown infection, this refers to what we generally know as unlinked community transmission, where despite the very best efforts in going through movement history, safe entry logs, and other contact tracing efforts, we are unable to see how these people are linked, and we see that these numbers start to increase. So on the other hand, uh, if with this very cautious easing, we don't see any significant increase or increase in unlinked transmission, this is the sign that the situation in Singapore has stabilized well enough that we can proceed on to the next phase. And I would actually like to think that other than this very clear indicators, I think the actions of the public will also convey a clear signal to the government whether the country as a whole is ready for more easing. And what are these actions? I think things like being conscious at workplaces to maintain safe distancing, minimizing in-person social interactions, that we become as a whole more responsible in registering our movements, perhaps with safe entry, clocking in, clocking out. These are not official cues, but this can send a very clear signal that the vast majority of the population actually are able to behave responsibly and be ready to move on to the next phase. Mm. Well, late last month, the government said it can carry out more than uh, 8,000 tests a day. Could increased testing also be a factor in determining when we move through the three phases? Well, the government announced then that they plan to increase the testing capacity uh, from 8,000 to potentially 40,000 per mm -hmm. day sometime in July, actually. So certainly having a large testing capacity increases the confidence that we can be more adventurous in deciding our plans uh, because we are able to test more frontline workers in essential and even the non-essential sectors to also perhaps include some clever ways to test the public randomly, perhaps through some degree of pooling people, pooling samples together in one test. And we don't just test people once off, we test the key frontline workers repeatedly. And this significantly increases our confidence that the frontline workers who regularly interact with large number of people, this staff are routinely free from infection. We have a way to confirm that. And this reduces the chance that they become the vectors that go on to infect others. So if now mm -hmm. you start to think about the ability to test, say weekly, people who work in retail stores, in restaurants, teachers in schools, on top of the, 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 the key frontline workers that we know about, mm -hmm. like doctors and nurses, cleaners, hawkers, this allow us to rapidly catch someone who is infected and who may not be displaying any symptoms yet. And we quickly put in place the contact tracing, the quarantine that we are very good at doing to minimize this, in, this infection. So in an ideal world, everyone in the country could be tested once a day, but without that ideal uh, situation, I think any increase in testing capacity will already allow us to test more and to identify people early. There may even be specific strategies that countries are thinking about that are tied to people who test negative, uh, say in the past seven days, and are thus allowed to move about with certain liberties, uh, in, in including some travel plans. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Prof, for the insight and the analysis. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, that was Professor Teo Yiging, Dean of the Saw Sui Hawk School of Public Health at the NUS. In other news, taxi giant Comfort Delgro is set to trial plastic shields in 400 of its cabs to separate the driver from passengers and hopefully reduce the spread of COVID-19. Called V-Shield, it's made of a hard transparent plastic material which also serves as added protection against physical harm to the driver. The shield covers the driver's cabin entirely without obstructing airflow in the rest of the cab and has two window openings for passengers to make payment. While pet services like grooming are allowed to resume from June 2nd, the sale of pets is still prohibited. Pet, pet owners take note. 
grooming services which are allowed include the maintenance of skin and fur, teeth brushing for dental hygiene and medicated bath, but not the cosmetic styling of pets, fur and spa bath. Those taking their pets for physiotherapy or rehabilitation will also need a referral from a vet to certify that the treatment is necessary. Non-essential services like pet sitting, daycare for animals, walking and boarding are still not allowed. Some businesses will be allowed to reopen from June 2nd, resulting in three quarters of the economy resuming operations. Trade and Industry Minister Chan Chun Singh said yesterday that businesses that operate in settings with lower transmission risks may resume activities. The Straits Times Associate Editor Vikram Khanna joins us now to discuss what Phase 1 will mean for the economy. Vikram, industries allowed to restart operations include manufacturing and production facilities in the semiconductor, medical technology and aerospace sectors, as well as wholesale trade and finance companies. Retail shops and dining in are still not allowed though. How much of a respite does Phase 1 bring for the economy? Okay, well... Um... I think there's good reason to give these sectors priority. That is manufacturing, financial services, business services, wholesale trade, and so on. As you mentioned, number one, they are relatively low touch sectors. Mm -hmm. There's very little customer facing uh, activity in these sectors. So that's number one. Number two is they are quite important for the economy. I mean, for example, manufacturing and financial services alone uh, account for almost half of GDP. So it makes sense to prioritize these sectors first. But uh, but that says that said, I mean, there are some risks even in these sectors. Um, uh, for example, in manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing, it, it depends partly on supply chain. So you can open your factory, but if your supplier's factory is not open, if your supplier's factory is in another country, for example, you may not get the inputs that you need to do production properly, right? right? So you've got to coordinate with the whole supply chain in order to be able to operate normally. Number two is that you have logistical issues. For example, there's uh, the sea freight and the air freight. I mean, they are capacity constrained because of COVID, right? So even if you produce, you may not be able to get your, produ get your products out easily, or you'll have to pay quite high costs for air freight and sea freight. So these are two issues that would limit the, the ability of manufacturing to fully come back. I mean, some of it will definitely come back, but not all of it, not easily. That's number one. On, on financial services, I think there's much less of a problem. I mean, financial services are already being delivered by remote quite successfully through the circuit breaker. So there should be a fewer issues there. So the, to answer, answer your question, it will be some respite for the economy. But I don't think that uh, you will have 75% of the economy back to normal um, quite, quite so soon. Hmm. Mm. Vikram, let's zoom in on the badly affected F&B sector for a little bit. The Business Times reported 159 secessions last month. What does Phase 1 spell for this sector? Well, they can't take part in Phase 1. So they are right. a Phase 2 there are phase two and that would come after some weeks if phase one is successful. But the issue there is that even if they are allowed to open, um, they will have to uh, put in place social distancing norms. For example, restaurants will have to you know, have two meters between tables and so on. Um, that means they'll have to operate at much below capacity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, taking into account the fact that a lot of people will not go to restaurants, even if they are allowed to open. People may not have the confidence to go. So you will have much reduced business in these places. And I think uh, some of these establishments may need to determine whether it, they, you know, it's worth their while to open with and operate at 30% capacity and to meet their overheads. It, 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 they may conclude that it's better to remain closed rather than open and run losses. So the same is true of gyms, for example. I mean, how many people will go to gyms and use equipment shared with other people? It, it, it's, it's an issue for them. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of these establishments, uh, some of them will open, some of them will, will manage to cover their costs, but, but I think a lot of them would have uh, much reduced business and may not be able to open or may not be able to be profitable. Mm 
So these establishments, I think, will continue to need government support, even though they are allowed to reopen. Right. And talking about uh, support, Vikram, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance uh, Minister Heng Sui Kiet will deliver a fourth uh, budget statement next Tuesday, May 26. What are you know new measures or enhancements are you expecting this time? Um, well, I think this would be an opportunity to recalibrate some of the measures in the earlier budgets. For example, uh, I would say that there are some sectors that are better able to stand on their own feet. For example, financial services I mentioned, telecoms is another one, uh, maybe IT services is another one, maybe supermarkets is another one. I think uh, these, these, industry, these sectors will not continue to need job support scheme and so on. So you can begin to phase out this scheme for some of these, some of these establishments, right? Uh, then as I mentioned, for more vulnerable establishments such as uh, the food and beverage sector, the retail sector, I think there would need to be continued support. Uh, I think for the self-employed, there would still need to be continued support, um, uh, may, may, maybe an extension of, of, of the SIRS, uh, what they've been given, or, or an enhancement of SIRS. Mm -hmm. I think there would also be uh, need for support for the unemployed, uh, more support for the unemployed, more automatic support for the unemployed, where you don't have to apply. If you, somebody loses their job, they're automatically eligible for support, that sort of thing. Then there are some radical ideas that some people have suggested. I'm not sure the finance minister will go for it. One of them is that uh, uh, the government should in take equity in, in certain companies, um, give them an equity infusion rather than make them take loans, which they have to pay back. Mm. Uh, mm. That's an interesting, an interesting idea. It should be on the table for discussion. I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but it's an interesting idea. Another idea is that uh, proposed by nominated MP Patisera for a universal basic income for a temporary period mm. where everybody gets a, a certain income every month because you can't predict who's going to lose their jobs. You, you don't know. It could be white-collar workers. It could be anybody. So mm. that, that, puts a, you know, that, that, that gives a sort of broad safety net um, uh, across the board for the economy. So these are some of the ideas that, that the, the finance minister could could, uh, could consider. Well, thanks so much for that, Vikram. So let's go through uh, the timeline of the three phases. Phase one will take a few weeks. Phase two is expected to last several months. And Singapore will only enter phase three when there's a vaccine. So given that timeline, what hits will the economy continue to take, specifically the spillover effects on jobs and wages? Well, the economy will, will remain extremely weak all the way until phase three. And phase three will not happen until probably the end of next year. I mean, I don't think you're gonna get a vaccine uh, discovered, tested, manufactured, deployed, and then people vaccinated uh, until the end of, end of next year, at least. So I think till through 2021, I think the economy will remain weak. Another thing, of course, is that you know, the rest of the world is, is going through a rough time. I mean, the U.S. economy, the Eurozone economy, Japan, even China and India, I mean, they're all facing negative growth. Mm. So I think, you know, this, this, is, this is going to continue well into 2021. So I think uh, it's, it's going to be a difficult period for Singapore. I think there's going to be uh, possibly lots of uh, company closures. Uh, possibly lots of layoffs. Uh, so I think Singapore needs to needs to have a sort of pretty broad uh, protection, social safety net, and protections for companies during this period, all the way up to the end of next year. Well, we appreciate your insights, Vikram. We've been speaking with Associate Editor at The Straits Times, Vikram Khanna. Let's now go to Dylan Ang for headlines around the world. Thanks, guys. The World Health Organization has agreed to an independent probe into its coronavirus response. Coming amid criticism from the US, the probe will look into their actions and timelines pertaining to the pandemic. In the latest war of words between the US and China, Beijing accused US President Donald Trump of smearing China and shirking responsibility to the WHO. On Monday, Mr Trump had called the WHO a puppet of China, 
before threatening to permanently freeze American funding to the organization. Jakarta has extended its large-scale social curbs until June 4th. According to the city's governor, people leaving their homes at dusk and night during Ramadan are reasons for the extension. Jakarta accounts for about a third of Indonesia's 18,000 cases. Meanwhile, the pandemic has forced the 7-Eleven franchise in Japan to ban its long-standing rule on 24-7 operations. 7-Eleven said on Sunday that it closed 236 locations across the country while declining to say how many stores had shortened their hours. Last month, in a first, a 7-Eleven owner closed his store amid the virus spread. His movement headlined and inspired others to do the same. It also led to 7-Eleven giving more freedom to owners during this time. The English Premier League confirmed six cases of COVID-19 from three different clubs out of a sample of 748 people. The tests were taken ahead of the return to small group training, part of the league's project restart which hopes to complete the unfinished 2020 season. No specific details were given as to clubs or individuals, but those who test positive have been asked to self-isolate for seven days. That's all for our global updates. Back to you. The National Day Parade that we've come to know and celebrate year after year will take a different form this year. Unlike previous parades, Singaporeans will celebrate the nation's 55th birthday in their homes instead of at a central location like the floating platform at Marina Bay. This year's celebrations will also see many parade segments moved to the heartland and streamed live on TV and online platforms. The evening show will be on a smaller scale as well and there won't be any national education or preview shows. Fun packs though traditionally given to parade attendees will be distributed to each Singaporean and permanent resident household this year. We are now joined by journalist Lee Min Sang to tell us more. Min Sang, this year's celebrations will see a completely different concept from previous NDPs. It will be a holy event with a morning and evening segment spread across Singapore. What else can we expect from this year's celebrations? Right, so other than the morning and evening proceedings like you mentioned, I think what is really special this year is the concept of the celebrations. So safe distancing measures and guidelines obviously still have to be adhered to um, as we expect them to be around for some time to come. So the idea is really to have Singaporeans celebrate at home and there should not be large gatherings even at the heartland locations where the highlights are expected to be at. For example, the Red Lions, um, three, four jumps, uh, as well as the mobile column. So um, the committee emphasized that you, know, you should not be gathering at uh, these locations and try to stay home and watch them as much as possible, especially as this a live stream. Right. Uh, Minchan, you mentioned that the mobile column and the Red Lions free fall drum will continue. How about the other crowd favourites like the aerial display and fireworks? Will we still see them this year? Yeah, so in fact, potentially more Singaporeans can see them this year as compared to previous parades because um, they are now spread out in more locations. For example, uh, the fireworks at the end of the evening show that will be set off at more than 10 locations. So the locations have not been disclosed yet, but we are looking forward to being able to watch um, the fireworks live in many different locations. And we can also expect the um, six F-15 SG fighter jets flying around the island formation as part of the aerial display. So these are some of the highlights that will be brought closer to Singapore. Mm, interesting. Certainly looking forward to it. Now, Min Sang, the current NDP plans are based on existing safe distancing measures, but we are also preparing for the easing of these measures after June 1st. In the event that, say, COVID-19 situation improves and more restrictions are lifted, will the plans change accordingly too as well? Conversely, is there any scenario where this year's show will be scrapped altogether? Right, so I guess one thing that you know, um, people will be wondering is, can we watch the parade or the evening show live as part of the audience on site? So for now, there's no plans for uh, live spectators at either of these venues. And of course, whether this would 
change, it will depend on the national guidelines that are prevailing at the time, especially um, the restrictions on large gatherings. And in the media briefing earlier today, um, the NDP Executive Committee Chairman, uh, Brigadier General Frederick Tu, he said that the concept they've come up with for NDP this year allows them to carry on with the celebrations even as the situation gets worse. So, and this is because um, the plan does not need spectators together and they can just stay at home to celebrate. Mm. What about the participants? What safety measures will be in place for them since there's still about 200 of them involved in the parade and about 100 for the evening show? Yeah, right. So we are told during the briefing that there's a dedicated committee that set up to look after the safety measures that were applied um, to the participants, such as making sure that they wear masks and have safe distancing and being located in different holding rooms during rehearsals, for example. So also no rehearsals have been done so far. We are still in the circuit breaker period. So the rehearsals only start after the circuit breaker period is over. And this is compared to previous NDPs where we understand rehearsals can start as early as in March. So another measure that was shared was how there will not be a large number of volunteers from the People's Association, uh, Singapore's Local Association, and the Ministry of Education. Mm. And uh, the performance this year will mainly be from the home team, the SCF, um, Music and Drama Company, and some local artists. So hopefully not having to manage uh, groups of people from different organizations, um, it'll be easier um, it will be easier to manage them. Mm. Well, definitely this year's celebration is uh, something to look forward to because uh, it's a very different concept, yeah? Well, thank you so much, uh, Min Sang, for taking time to speak with us. We we're speaking to journalist Lim Min Sang on how the National Day celebrations will be different this year amid the coronavirus pandemic. Let's go back to Dylan for what's also in the news. In a move to boost e-commerce offerings, social media giant Facebook is launching a new shopping feature. Called Shops, it will enable businesses to set up an online store accessible via Facebook and Instagram. A checkout feature will also allow in-app purchases, and customers will be able to chat with businesses through WhatsApp, Messenger or Instagram. Healthcare conglomerate Johnson & Johnson is to stop selling talc-based baby powder in the US and Canada. This is part of a broad reassessment of its consumer portfolio prompted by the COVID-19 pandemic. J&J faces lawsuits from consumers claiming its talc products, including Johnson's baby powder, caused their cancer. But J&J said it remains confident in the product's safety. In October of last year, J&J recalled more than 30,000 bottles of baby powder in the United States after the FDA said it had found trace amounts of asbestos and samples taken from a bottle purchased online. The voluntary recall was limited to one lot of Johnson's baby powder produced and shipped in the United States in 2018, the company said at the time. In December 2019, Johnson & Johnson said that tests showed that its baby powder was free of asbestos, after FDA investigations reported trace amounts of the material in the product. Thanks to facial recognition, a Chinese man who was kidnapped as a toddler 32 years ago has been reunited with his biological parents. He was just two when he was snatched from outside a hotel in Xi'an in 1988 and sold to a childless couple who raised him as their own. Police had acted on a tip-off and aged one of his childhood photos before tracking him down, with a DNA test later confirming his identity. Record British fundraiser Colonel Tom Moore is set to be knighted after a special nomination by UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Colonel Moore raised £33 million for the National Health Service in the run-up to his 100th birthday last month, when he completed 100 laps of his garden. Annoyed that you can't eat while wearing a face mask? That might soon change. Israeli inventors have created a mask with a remote control mouth that lets diners eat without taking it off. They say the device could make a visit to a restaurant less risky. With a squeeze of a lever, a slot in the front of the mask opens. The company plans to manufacture the mask within months. Oh God. I'm Dylan Ang, back to you.
my goodness, right. I think the mask right. actually looks quite silly. So, Jan, would you actually <laughs> wear that in public? I mean, if it allows me to dine in with my friends, why not, right? Although it does look creepy. Yeah, it looks but insane. But hey, I guess if it, yeah, <laughs> if it protects myself, it protects, you know, my friends, why not? Right, I don't think it will take <laughs> off though because you have to use a lever to, to open the to open yeah. the, the, the slot, right? So, and can you imagine yeah. eating with like a fork and a knife or like a spoon and a fork? I don't think that will, I don't think that's uh, actually very possible. Well, I anyway, do, I uh, do those... ice cream as well. Wow, well, yeah, good point. Well, those are yeah. our top stories for today. For more news and vis videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Mm -hmm. Once again, I'm Harian Tudiman with Olivia Kuei. Join us tomorrow for more stories on A Big Story.